Okay, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here to our panel on the future of Wall Street. I'm Rob Schaefer, the CEO of the Americas for Credit Suisse. Uh, and um, it's been over five years since the financial crisis. And as we all know, the change that has taken place from regulatory to business models to virtually everything has really been unprecedented. Uh, we have a distinguished group of panel, panelists here to talk about um, the future of Wall Street, certain, starting to my right. Obviously, we have Senator Chris Dodd, who doesn't need much of an introduction, former senator for 30 years in Connecticut, and now the CEO of the uh, Motion Picture Industry of America. Uh, we have Richard Daly, uh, the president and CEO of Broadridge Financial Solutions. Uh, we have Bob Diamond, the former CEO of Barclays, and now currently the head of Atlas Merchant Capital, uh, a firm founded uh, with a focus primarily on Africa. <coughs> We've got Tom Milroy, the CEO of the Bank of Montreal Capital Markets. And we've got Ruth Parrett to my left, the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Morgan Stanley. So let's begin with, uh, with Senator Dodd here. So we're sitting here, it's been over five years since the crisis, and uh, you know, one of the biggest you know, architects of financial reform was certainly you and your bill. As you look back for over five years uh, since the bill, you know, did it accomplish what you wanted to accomplish? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this and, uh, mm -hmm. distinguished panel, and Mike Milken's a good friend. So I've appeared once before years ago on a, one of the panels at uh, this conference, so it's nice to be back, and thank you again. Well, no, th the answer to that question is you don't know yet, obviously. It's been less than 48 months since the bill was signed into law, and about six years since the, the, the crisis, September of 2008, being the epicenter of events. And, and we'll know in time, obviously. Uh, there's nothing biblical about this legislation. Uh, you did the best you could under the circumstances. I don't know anyone who thinks that the world would have been a better place had we left all the institutions in place in September of 08 going forward after the TARP legislation, which may have been the most unpopular piece of legislation and maybe the most necessary in the last 50 years, in my view, to stabilize financial institutions. Uh, but we had to move beyond that, in my view. Uh, you couldn't just leave the situation, the status quo, without responding uh, to those events to try and deal with the architectural questions about financial institutions. So time will tell. Uh, there's certainly going to be changes to it in time. Uh, that's, uh, that anything, a bill longer than two or three pages, I presume, would have changes to it at some point. I'm not offended by that in the slightest, in fact. No one has a crystal ball in all of this. You do the best you can. Mustering 60 votes in the Senate, which I had to do, uh, is not easy. This is not an executive decision. Every member of Congress, all 535, are co-equal members, and they all have a, an ability, and any one of those senators can veto the legislation, in fact, or filibuster it. So it took time to put it together, and we'll see uh, how it works out. Uh, issues like too big to fail, how the VOCA rule works, whether or not the FSOC does the job we want it to do, how well the Consumer Protection Bureau is functioning, whether or not the goal of harmonization of rulemaking, not only here but globally, will take some root uh, as we look uh, in the rest of this century coming forward. So time will tell uh, as to whether or not we achieved as much as we wanted to. The, the, the question I think is important as well in all of this, though, is, is whether or not it's working at all. And again, uh, my own view is I think it is, uh, but that's not important what my view is. The question is how, how are people reacting to it? Number one, a lot of the institutions are not waiting for full implementation, but incorporating a lot of the ideas into their credit, in my view, is smart to do so, rather than waiting around necessarily to see every dotted I and cross T in the process. Capital and liquidity have increased dramatically. I think that's helped stabilize. The stress tests that have occurred already of the 30 largest financial institutions or banks did very well. Only one didn't do terribly well in all of that. Uh, so they indicate that things are moving. A lot of the most risky Part of the enterprises have been dropped. In my view, the VOCA rule is in place, and I think having some beneficial effect as well. Uh, so overall, I think it's working, uh, and again. And again, that's not to suggest there aren't provisions where there are unintended consequences, as people like to talk about. When you have that kind of a large piece of legislation, you're obviously going to have some of that. The only last thing I want to say to you, Bob, if I can, in all of this, and you pose the question, and obviously, in a room like this, particularly people are interested in the regulations and how they're working, are they overly burdensome, are they uh, duplicative, all the normal questions you'd get. It's important to remember, when we talk about this, the, the human element uh, that occurs here. Uh, as a result of this crisis, the largest since the Great Depression of 80 years ago, there was $12 trillion of national wealth that evaporated, 26 million people in this country lost their jobs, 5 million homes went into foreclosure. Uh, you have iconic 
industries and companies uh, that are part of the carnage. Two of your largest investment banks failed. The two had to be merged. Two became banking institutions. Uh, commercial banks uh, failed as well. We bailed out many more, the tune of $700 billion at taxpayer expense. Your thrifts, two of them failed. Credit unions, the largest insurance company, uh, when, had to be nationalized in the process. That's only 48 months ago <laughs> a lot of that happened. And certainly we talk about all of this. It's important, I think, in a conference like this to be mindful of that element as well as we move forward. Uh, and not to forget that most of these people will never recover from what they've been through. And so we talk about it in terms of the public perception, whether or not we're doing the job. Are we restoring the confidence? I kept that word in mind as much as I could during this process. It had been shattered in the country and globally to a large extent. Could we end up ending too big to fail, getting rid of the implicit and explicit guarantee that as an institution, the federal government, the taxpayers would bail you out if you got yourself into trouble? Uh, I don't, 92 to 5, a vote in the Senate. Richard Shelby, the Republican, offered the amendment. I supported him in it. I'd like to think it works. We'll see in time. Hopefully, we'll never have to test it. But if you do, I'd like to think it worked. The FSOC, the, uh, the, the Financial Services Oversight, getting our regulatory bodies to speak to one another. The bill requires only four meetings a year. Last year, there were 32 meetings between regulators, talking about product lines, talking about institutions. Are there systemic risks that we ought to be conscious of? Uh, the Consumer Protection Bureau. Had I eliminated the Consumer Protection Bureau, the bill would have had 80, 85 votes. Uh, but frankly, I thought having consumer protection ought not to be such a radical idea when it comes to financial services. Uh, and then the harmonization, which I mentioned. And I'll end on this note. In April of 2008, the G20 proposed some 20 ideas long before we got to the bill itself. Uh, ideas on how we ought to harmonize rulemaking globally. I didn't announce it, candidly, for all the obvious reasons. I announced that I was tracking the G20. You can imagine the political reaction to that kind of an idea. But I tracked it very carefully uh, to try and come up with a system that would appeal uh, to uh, global partners. Because obviously metastasizing these problems on a global basis makes it very difficult for us to respond to it. Lastly, I didn't want the United States to play follow-up. And I say that respectfully of other areas of the world. But a large of these problems were created here. It seemed to me that we ought to step up and not play by someone else's rules, but try to establish ours as the leading country when it came to financial services. So that is a backdrop. And again, don't know yet whether it's going to do all the things we want to. By and large, I think it's working. Thanks, Senator. I think that's a, that's a great uh, broad perspective on uh, really describing everything. But let me turn to the industry side of this thing. Ruth, from an industry perspective, <clears throat> I mean, how do you feel about the changes in regulations? Are they working? Are banks safer? Well, first, Senator, um, just to be clear, your regulatory and policy focus now is just movies and no longer me. So um, and I, we're happy you're enjoying that there. But to be, to be fair, the, the, um, the changes were substantial. Uh, the industry is fundamentally transformed, and it's transformed, I would say, for the better. And the senator delineated the items. We have more capital. We have more liquidity. We have capital stress tests and liquidity stress tests. We have the change in activities. We have more resources behind risk and risk analytics. We have higher... Um, teams across the country on compliance. So you can go line item by line item. I think the senator did a fantastic job really delineating how fundamentally the industry has transformed. And I completely agree when you go through the pain of 2008, we had to transform. Some transformed kicking and screaming, but we transformed. And so it's a fundamentally different place today than we were in 2008. To me, what's most concerning, therefore, is w what are the early signs of potential risk that could become that next problem as we sit here today? And there are really four that are, are highest on, on my list. First is the rise of central clearing. I frankly think one of the best elements that came out of Dodd-Frank was reforming the derivatives market. We have greater transparency in derivatives, we have greater standardization in derivatives, but the question is, more of that risk is moving to clearinghouses. And many are operating with um, strong risk management and governance, but not all. And so again, incumbent as we're seeing trillions literally moving into clearing, that we look at the risk there. The second is products moving into what some call the unregulated sector, shadow banking, market-based finance, whatever you want to call it. But again, just moving risk from the regulated sector to another part of the market doesn't mean we're eliminating the risk. So how are we managing? Third, which may seem slightly a field, but I think is quite relevant, is the dramatic growth in student lending. It's now over a trillion dollars, up 4x since 2004. We're adding 100 billion a year um, that's government financed. And one of the key 
problems is there's a presumption that you cannot default on your student loans in this country because the government can garnish Social Security. And so we're seeing a huge volume of origination, which looks very similar to Fannie Freddie. And we're seeing the early signs of that, which then leads to the last one, um, Fannie Freddie. When Hank Paulson, Secretary Paulson, talked about the move to conservatorship, he was very clear to describe it as a timeout. It was a timeout to come out with a better structure. And yes, there are proposals now, but they're still not done. The devil's in the details. And resolving or coming up with that, that final state for our housing market, I think, is also important. So I would add those to the list. I think the work that the center led has been key in conjunction with what the Federal Reserve has done and what Basel has done to meaningfully transform our industry. And now we need to start focusing on what's next. Thanks, Ruth. And Tom, from a Canadian perspective, I'm curious to get your same, uh, your same judgment in terms of uh, everything you've heard thus far. Yeah, I mean, I would echo uh, Ruth's comments in terms about, I think we are in a better place today, uh, but we don't know where the next crisis will come from. Um, you know, I would add to the list of things that have changed the fact that I actually think that the managements of the banks generally are a lot smarter about the business and the risks that they're having. I think they understand those risks better. I think they're making much better balance sheet decisions, and, and I think we're making the right trade-offs between risk and reward. I would go on to say, though, that the reforms have raised a number of fears, I think some of which are unjustified, but some that are not. Obviously, you know, people say with the, the regulation comes a lot of increased costs for the industry, and, and that's true. The reality is that it has. You know, costs are up, bottom line down, there's more capital, so returns are impacted. Um, but, but I think that's just uh, one of those facts of life, and I, I believe that we'll figure a way to be profitable you know, in that context. Um, that being said, I, I think we still run a pretty significant risk in terms of just the overwhelming complexity of all the layers of rules. And so that's something that I'm hopeful over time will be you know, an objective that we as an industry working with the regulators can get at. Um, I guess the other fear you know, is that capital would be more expensive. And when people say this, I think they're focusing on not the banks but the users of capital. But Clearly, for the banks, capital is more expensive. Um, but what we've seen so far, notwithstanding that's happened to us immediately, is for our clients, capital has not become more expensive. And there are a lot of other pools of capital that have stepped up you know, to provide the financing necessary to, to drive the growth that we would expect in the economy. Uh, my concern is what happens when you know, interest rate environment is different, when times are, are less uh, conducive. Uh, and I think there will be less liquidity in the market at that time because clearly there's less liquidity coming from the banks. It's interesting, Tom. You know, you mentioned the complexity uh, with the rules. I mean, I want to uh, turn it over to Bob here. From a global perspective, one of the, I know one of the things we struggle with is um, navigating through all the different rules, through all the different um, jurisdictions. Um, when you look at it globally, whether it's Europe versus U.S., you know, given your perspective, uh, or emerging market versus developed markets, how do you see uh, this thing working out with, the, with these regulatory changes? You know, Rob, I think that's <clears throat> such an interesting question because I think it's almost three or four different stories. If you look at the big U.S. banks, the, the, the U.S. SIFI banks, particularly the ones that were uh, more global or more complex, depending on your terminology, um, the political leaders in the U.S., the U.K., and Europe, not just the regulators, do not yet believe that too big to fail or too big to manage has been eradicated. And I think the bigger issue is that they, don't, they do not believe that too big to fail or too big to manage can be eradicated. And so in my, my personal opinion, that's the wrong approach. I do think there's a regulatory toolkit around resolution and recovery and living wills, things the senator worked on, which should be the next move. Um, as Ruth said, the big U.S. banks are far safer and far sounder today. So is there a way to move forward with, with too big to fail and eradicating it? But to be honest, I think that's the stumbling block. Banks right now are still, uh, is, is J.P. Morgan recently exited the commodities trading business. Um, the separation of risk from deposits um, and the limitation on doing any kind of deal or size is going to limit uh, the U.S. banks. Europe, though, is more complex and deeper. The European banks, in my opinion, have not shown as much in terms of deleveraging, increasing capital. We'll see this from the stress tests. And I mean, this is a bold statement, but I can't think of a single bank in the Eurozone 
that today is earning its cost of equity. And so they need to continue under Basel III of bringing capital back home, not just because balkanization is kind of the right thing to do, but because they have to continue to focus on putting their capital in businesses where they have or can have scale, because that's the only chance they have to earn their cost of equity. And so you see the European banks in Africa pulling capital back home. You see the European banks who have invested so heavily in Eastern Europe pulling the capital back home. And this is having serious and fundamental consequences on some of those banking environments. You know, for Credit Suisse, for your bank and for UBS, in some ways, ironically, you're ahead of the curve in transforming your business model because the Swiss regulators were the most severe in terms of very, very high. I remember we thought outrageous capital levels. And, and mm -hmm. so you began that shift away from risk toward risk management, uh, sorry, toward, toward asset management mm -hmm. and toward wealth. But some of the emerging economies are fascinating. As you mentioned, for, for me, Africa is, is very interesting. And Africa needs investment and needs innovation. Without that, the, the economy is not going to grow and jobs aren't going to be created. The, the typical business model in sub-Saharan Africa <laughs> is take a deposit and buy a Nigerian T-bill or a Botswana T-bill and earn 1,000, 1,200 basis points. But what the, what the uh, public policy needs and what Governor Sanusi in Nigeria was trying to do is he was increasing the capital charge on holding domestic T-bills is to get money to consumers and to get money to businesses. The Chinese companies come down with stapled financing um, from the Chinese banks. The global companies have a huge opportunity to borrow from the, from the global banks. If we can't, if we can't get funding to the SMEs in Africa, it will have an impact on economic growth. So there it's about innovation. It's about investment. It's about the um, changing the operating model. It's about specialized agricultural lending units. It's about being able to securitize some of the assets so, so more money uh, gets to small businesses. So I think it's three very different stories. Um, and these will come together over time, but my sense is it's a number of years uh, of restructuring of the banks in the Eurozone before we see them at the same position that, that some of the big US banks. It's just very interesting to, to think about how interlinked the financial you know, uh, services businesses and, and, and the impact on some of the emerging market economies as a result of some of the regulation that you speak of. Um, we could talk about regulation, the entire panel, and uh, since this is the future of Wall Street panel, I do want to move on to a second, a second subject, which is technology and how technology is really changing the game in terms of disintermediating businesses, creating new business models. But let's start um, with, the, uh, with just the, on the regulatory side, you know, dealing with all the regulation, how to implement it, how to manage your businesses, where technology is such a critical piece of this going forward. Richard, I'd like you to comment on you know, how you're seeing the trends and you know, sort of where you see this thing going. Thanks. Well, first of all, at, at Broadridge, we're fortunate in that we don't need to have a view and don't have a view on whether a regulation is a good regulation or a bad regulation, okay? However, once a regulation is established for the five to six trillion a day of settlements that were the software engine behind, we need to figure out the implementation. And I think to some degree there's a disconnect between the regulatory goals and the implementation. And the reason I think that disconnect exists is that goals are established and then regulations are written and the technology isn't considered in that process. And whether you're looking to fix a problem from the past, identify a problem going forward, or just to create overall safety for investors, the technology piece, which ultimately is required for execution, needs to be moved up front in the process. So after the goal is established, when the rules are written, it would be great if the practical reality that we're all dealing with, which is execution, gets considered in the rulemaking processes as well. That's interesting. Were you going to say something? Well, just please? a couple of things. Uh, just to react to some of the things that, that, that were said. I, I, um, uh, let me deal with too big to fail, uh, Bob, if I can, first of all. I mean, just as a, as a matter now of law, uh, it is against, would be against the law to do what we did in the fall of 2008. Uh, and, and we never could have even thought about passing this bill without addressing too big to fail uh, as a mm -hmm. political matter. But even if you and I, people like, like uh, former Secretary Geithner and others have hesitation, to put it mildly, about uh, 
the, the, the strictness of the too big to fail provisions, uh, I think was your point. But as a practical political matter, I cannot imagine a Congress, particularly this one, but any future one as well, going through what we did in the fall of 2008 again. Yep. Uh, it would be an, uh, unthinkable. In fact, it's something just to comment on. Here you had both the House and the Senate, uh, the majority were Democrats in, in September of 2008. The administration obviously was President Bush. Uh, and to step up 40 days before a national election and write the TARP legislation, which they said may be the singularly most unpopular piece of legislation uh, in the last 50 years or more. I can't imagine today a similar circumstance occurring uh, where you would have a Republican Congress uh, with Obama in, in trouble financially stepping up and doing what was done in the fall of 2008. In fact, some very good members, having, having managed the Senate bill, which passed 75 to 24. The only missing senator that day was Ted Kennedy, who was very sick at the time and dying. Uh, I went around that evening to uh, Democrats and Republicans who were up for re-election in 40 days and mentioned that I had the votes to carry the bill. And if they wanted to take a pass on the legislation, I would understand and never, their names would never cross my lips again. Uh, I'll never forget uh, talking to Gordon Smith. I'll tell the story because he knows I've told it about him. Uh, I told him I, if he wanted to vote no on the bill, I realized this was going to be a devastating political outcome for him if he did vote for it. And I'll never forget his answer to me. He said, I really appreciate the offer. He said, but I've got to face a constituent tomorrow morning, and I don't know how I'd explain the vote. And I said, well, who's the constituent you have to see? He said, the mirror. <laughs> because I happen to believe this is the right thing to do for the country at the time. And he lost the election in 40 days. Bob Bennett of Utah, a Republican, lost his next election. There's a, there's, a, there's a list of people who lost their seat in the Congress because they cast that vote, knowing full well what the implications would be. Secondly, the international stuff that was mentioned, I want to emphasize that point. Because clearly that was in my mind, looking at this, I mentioned <coughs> the G20's recommendations. And, and I've been asked a lot of times, what's the next crisis, what are you worried about in all of this? My great worry is that we wrote a lot of these rules, and, and you talk about the Eurozone, which fairly, these are developed, sophisticated, mature economies. The problem is the next crisis, when it comes, and it clearly will, uh, how are we going to deal with institutional questions in places like Russia and India and Brazil and China, which are clearly going to be a part of the next crisis financially? And my great worry is that, that not establishing ground rules on financial services in these developing markets, which are going to play such a critical role in the future, will pose some significant risks to all of us. And we haven't even come close, in my view, to achieving that result. Interesting comment. Let me uh, let, let me stay on the on the topic of uh, of technology because you know we've talked about you know changing the, the changing business models and we've talked about the linkages in the system. I mean, Ruth, I want to turn to you for a second. One of the topics people talk about is cybersecurity and the threat that it you know poses to the overall industry. And you know clearly the biggest banks have the resources, can spend the money, uh, you know, and hopefully you know protect their systems. But you're only as good as the weakest linkages in the systems. And you know, how do you how do you think about that? You know, on behalf of Morgan Stanley or the overall system, in terms of how do you protect, you know, the firm and your clients? Well, I do think it's a rising a rising threat, and I do think we collectively need to remain vigilant. Uh, we think about it in three different buckets. First, when you're thinking about the financial services sector, we're relying on the telecommunications grid and we're relying on the power grid as an industry. And so it, it has to be a cross-industry look. Second, you made the right point, which is this is expensive and so tougher for smaller institutions to make the types of investments that are needed, and we are connected. And when you go right to that point that we're connected, it then begs the question, well, what about the infrastructure of financial services? What about payments? What about exchanges? So it is a broad problem, which is what's so concerning. You don't know where the threat's coming from. It can, it can come in from a number of different areas. I think the good news is increasingly we're seeing the industry come together and work really across sector and from the largest to the smallest institution mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we are mutually dependent upon the investments and efforts of different parties. And increasingly, we're also seeing the government work across industry. Again, going back to the, the point that we need to ensure we have a safe, sound, strong, resilient uh, power grid and telecommunications industry. But I, it's, it's a rising concern, no question about it, and more resources going into it. Mm -hmm. I'd be remiss if I were using the uh, subject of technology to not bring up high frequency trading. So uh, obviously a lot's been spoken about uh, that and the business model and whether the market's rigged. Bob, your perspective on high frequency trading and, and really just overall how technology is changing the overall business model. Well, 
I think Michael Lewis is probably a better authority on high frequency <laughs> trading, so I'll take the part on technology because I'm not going to go against what uh, Mike, Michael's just too good a writer and too popular right now. Um, you know, to, I, I think, Rob, technology is fascinating. To, to your point, Senator, I agree with your conclusion, which is that, is that elected officials absolutely cannot go back to where they went to before. So there's going to be continued limitations of size, limitations of complexity. And in doing that, whether it's the business model Credit Suisse has of moving more toward asset management and, and wealth management, it's also technology. Mm -hmm. And the big banks, Morgan Stanley, Barclays, all of us for years thought everything we did was proprietary. We thought all of our technology was proprietary. And we're realizing today that things like static data Every one of us have big data issues. Every one of the big banks have static data. It could be done industry-wide and save millions and millions and millions of dollars. And those things are becoming more important in an industry that, 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 that um, leverages <coughs> down, uh, capital ratios are higher. Um, Peter Kinez, who runs InCapture Technologies, which is a business uh, our merchant bank invested in, is building the next generation asset management firm. And they've spent two and a half years before they invested an asset building the technology. Because of what's available with cloud-based technology, it's very different because of big data, because of the importance regulatory-wise of, of being able to have straight through processing to clients and whatnot. So I think, I think technology is gonna play a much bigger role. But one of the advantages, I saw this when we were doing a project in Africa and looking at what Echo Bank, which expanded into 30 different countries in Africa, and when they expanded into Francophone West Africa, they spent $50 million building um, a data center. You don't have to spend $50 million on anything today. With the opportunity of cloud-based technology uh, in an intelligent layer, something like that can be done for a few million dollars and it completely changes the dynamics. So high frequency trading, I think, is, is a separate issue around business model. But the kind of technology that was developed there as that gets applied more broadly to financial services, I think is going to be a huge enabler in financial services recovering. I mean, Richard, I see you smiling over there. I, 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 I've got to give you the layup question here. I mean, you've just heard what Bob had to say about technology and how it's, it's really changing the landscape and how you know, much more cost efficient a lot of these solutions are vis-a-vis -vis where they were just a few years ago. You must be seeing this all over the place in your business. Absolutely. Of course, I love what Bob just said, and I had to use all my self-restraint when he said we need to come <laughs> together to uh, avoid from raising my hand up. Um, <laughs> so if you look, look, life's about execution, and you can't execute today without technology. There are a number of redundant functions that are happening across the industry combined with the vast amount of regulation that everybody needs to keep up with, and everybody's regulatory spend today in financial services is huge. So to create an environment where, the, you know, the new nice word for outsourcing is called cost mutualization. <laughs> so we're part of a whole cost mutualization activity, all right? And, but, it, but it's not a labor arbitrage pay, okay? What it is, is it's an intellectual capital arbitrage play because to get this right, you really need very expensive, very smart people that even for the largest of institutions is difficult to justify if they can identify it. So for the industry to come together to look at dealing with regulation, where everyone has huge costs to do the same redundant functions to get it implemented. Beyond that, there's the opportunity for, I'll call it some low-hanging fruit around safety, all right? where as you put these things together, the fact that they're together, you can get a view of the overall risk for, excuse me, far better than when it's individual pieces. And most importantly, what everyone's talking about here is there's a recognition that there will be a next crisis. There's somewhat of a proven history that the next crisis won't be the last crisis. So even on the things that were done right to prevent the last crisis, it won't prevent the next crisis. And to use technology and the industry together to look at these pending items and with combined data and combined activity to try to get in front of it with a technology model that says two things. One, how do we identify what it could be? And two, how do we upfront identify if and when it happens the plan of action versus you know, the morning after um, being called to a meeting saying, and now what are you going to do? You know, at Broadridge, 
we were called to the morning after Lehman meeting, all right? And in that case, it was fortunate. We were able, because Lehman was on our platform, to get Newberger out before the broker-dealer was put into bankruptcy. That can happen for every entity where you have seg positions right now and the investing public doesn't know how safe seg really is and how severe the rules are on the industry if you ever violate keeping customer assets segregated. We have a plan right now that would say that in the event of a problem, okay, within 24 to 48 hours, that seg position could be moved to a safe industry position with access to the customers and liquidity versus what happens today, which is, you know, years to unwind. You know, I'm, I'm intrigued. I don't think there's anything, as I'm thinking what you're saying here, in fact, one of the things we, a number of things we did in the bill is to make it very possible for technology to play a critical role. The real-time data of the Treasury Department now, which should have existed years ago in research, so you have real information occurring on a daily basis with an independent administrator, by the way, so it doesn't get politicized in the institution. The FSOC idea, uh, that would actually have regulators sitting down with each other, looking over the horizon, what's occurring out there, what's occurring globally, what's occurring in product lines and so forth. Again, relying on technology uh, to be able to make those decisions. Lehman's a good example. In my view, Lehman didn't have to end up where it did, uh, and clearly had, had better information responding earlier to these problems. Bear Stearns, over the weekend of March 15th, 16th, and 17th of 2008, acting as if this somehow was a one-off problem when we now know from reliable sources, we came within about 10 minutes of declaring a bank holiday the following Monday uh, after all of that. This is all these kind of things precipitous, uh, not well thought out, not spotting these problems earlier on. You don't stop crises, but to the extent you can identify them earlier on and respond to them, utilizing technology makes all the sense in the world. And I don't know of anything in the bill itself Bob, that would have prohibited or prohibits the use of technology to make those determinations. In fact, I'd like to think we, we, we welcome it in, in terms of making those decisions or anticipating problems. Well, so now I, I, I appreciate everything you're saying and I'm <coughs> disagreeing. And at Broadridge, we actively work with the SEC on a number of activities, particularly in proxy regulation and other regulations. Mm -hmm. And so post the crisis, the SEC went from, I'll call it a lawyer mindset, where a number of accountants mm -hmm. were authorized to be hired. I think the next piece that's missing is a number of technologists being made part of the process and part of the regulatory process. So when the rules get written, yeah. okay, there's a clear view that we can execute versus here's the legislation mm -hmm. um, and now it's up for grabs. In the case of TARP, um, we had a very interesting time where I had to say to clients where we're having such difficulty getting it executed. You know, for the record, I didn't come to you and say I thought TARP was a good idea yeah. and let's do it together. We were given TARP, now we have to execute it, and in our case, our estimate on executing TARP from the theory of the regulation to what actually the rules came out to be, we only missed that by 14 times. So it was, it was a very expensive process. Had regulation <coughs> been made part of what we're trying to achieve, I think it would have had been implemented more effectively um, with, with, with far less unintended consequences. Yeah. Well, I, listen, again, having gone through that process, I, uh, uh, certain things, memories you have, as long as I live, I'll never forget the night of September 18th at 7.30 p.m. when Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke had just met the president and came up to meet with the leadership of the House and the Senate, about 14 of us in Speaker Pelosi's office, and ben, to quote Ben Bernanke verbatim, because it's one of those moments that sears in your memory, he said the following, he said, unless you act in a matter of days, the entire financial system of this country and a good part of the world will melt down. Needless to say, the oxygen left the room. This was not anybody giving a talk. This is the most important central banker in the world announcing to the leadership of the House and the Senate what was pending. Now, historians will debate whether or not you even needed TARP, I suppose, uh, whether or not philosophically that was necessary or not. As I said earlier, I'll go to my grade believing we did the right thing. But at 1.30 in the morning, I received a two and a half page bill from Hank Paulson saying, give me $700 billion, no court, no regulator can intervene. Needless to say, when that became public information about 12 hours later, mm -hmm. the country exploded <laughs> in a rage of anger <laughs> over the idea that taxpayer would be asked to write a check for that amount to bail out institutions that had caused the problem. Uh, and I was given then two weeks, along with Judd Gregg, my Republican colleague from New Hampshire, to write a piece of legislation that would pass the Congress. 
Uh, needless to say, you're, you're sort of traveling in the dark on that one with a limited amount of time to respond uh, to the bill. And I, I agree with you. I think, in retrospect, we could have done things differently, but we were given a tremendous amount of pressure, under a tremendous amount of pressure, to write that legislation in a very brief amount of time. I, I absolutely, yeah. not only one, don't envy the severe responsibilities you had, to I'm part of the group that said that if the bailout didn't happen, uh, life as we know it would not exist. So, yeah. so on a personal basis, yeah. I'm very, very grateful. And I'm not looking back. Mm -hmm. I'm saying as we go forward, yeah. all right, we live in a world driven by technology. And the <coughs> answers that we come forward with are going to be driven by technology. And so before we get to the next crisis, as we talked about, mm -hmm. as we talk about making our markets safer, all right, technology needs to be a clear part of that. I agree with and, you. And every institution of the government really could benefit yeah. by adding more technology to the process, yeah. or okay, beyond adding more lawyers and accountants. The one thing I can almost yeah. guarantee will not happen, and that is you will not find Congress being willing to fund the SEC because it's subject to the appropriation process. Not The Fed is not, the OCC is not, the FDIC is not, but the CFTC and the SEC are. And so historically what you do when you don't like the bill is starve the agency responsible for doing these things. The one regret I have, uh, oh, there are several, but the one regret anyway I'd mention <laughs> to you is that we didn't self-fund the SEC and uh, the legislation. And I couldn't do it because frankly if I tried to do it, I would have lost two or three votes and never passed the bill because appropriators don't want to give up jurisdiction <laughs> on, on the appropriation process over the SEC. But with the F Federal Trade Commission and others, we've seen historically what happens, and that is if you don't like what they're doing, starve them, <laughs> and don't make it possible for them to do anything. So I worry that your advice will not be followed because we won't provide the adequate resources. But I think, right. Senator, as you said earlier, you know, I, I think you know, this is all learning experience, and I think everybody, I, I think I speak for really everybody that says, you know, I think everybody admires the courage that was displayed during that time of crisis and the steps that were taken to preserve the, uh, the financial you know, world as, mm -hmm. as we know it today. I think the idea certainly of you know, bringing more of the technologists into the discussion for implementation, yeah. I think is a very novel one. Let's move forward though, um, because one of the things, one of the real consequences of, of all this change has been the requirement for much, more, uh, much higher levels of capital uh, in the banking system. And that, you know, as Bob points out, certainly for the likes of the Swiss banks and the rest of the world, has forced us to look in the mirror and really ask ourselves, okay, what businesses you know, can we be in? Where are we good? How are we gonna much more effectively allocate our capital uh, in a much uh, you know, more you know, higher capital requirement world? So models are changing. You're seeing, obviously, you know, the growth of the, the non-bank financial uh, system. So I think this is really a, a question for everybody. And I'm gonna start with Tom on this. You know, in terms of, as you look at your own business in this new, new world, and you look forward over the next five years, where do you see things going? Where do you see the opportunities? You know, where, how do you see the industry evolving over the next five years? Yeah, I guess the first thing I would say is that the industry, for the reasons you suggested, has changed a lot over the last five years. So a lot has happened. Um, so as I look at it, I think that uh, the industry will change, <laughs> but moderately. I think what you'll see is firms adopting differentiated <coughs> business models. Um, I, I think the changes that we talked about to capital, liquidity, leverage, you know, combined with the increased complexity of the regulatory regimes that we all operate under, you know, are gonna nece necessitate all of us to you know, f focus very heavily on how we reduce costs, um, think very carefully about how we allocate capital and, and spend more time on those risk or reward decisions. And you know, all of this has to be done uh, you know, with an eye to making sure we are compliant, not just with the letter of, of the regulations, but also with the spirit behind them, and in a way that doesn't damage our, our reputational, uh, you know, our reputations as an industry. I mean, I think the industry has to really work hard to win back the, the confidence of everyone we deal with, and I think that's actually gonna allow the regulators to back you know, I think we, we own some of the responsibility for the complexity. But I do think, you know, looking down the aisle here to Richard, I do think this is an area where, as we focus on, one of the obvious things that we see is, you know, an opportunity to reduce costs through looking at technology that's outsourced, that's in some sort of a utility third-party uh, platform. So we're very uh, convinced that, you know, as we get through meeting some of the immediate demands we have. And none of this is, has been done on a timetable that says, okay, let's just ignore that for a while and get to the end game. 
we've all had to run around, invest a lot into responding immediately of uh, the demands that are put on us. Uh, but I think down the road, we're going to be doing, looking at and, and doing more of that. You know, I, I, ultimately, I come back to the basic, though. And I, th I think the firms that, that do it the right way, that focus on their clients, that focus on the relationship, and, then, and work closely with them to make sure that they get what they need in a way that actually works for us, and that's how we viewed the uh, banking uh, business all along, are the ones that are going to survive. And so we'll evolve, and we're going to make, we've exited businesses, there's others where we are doubling down, and that'll be a different mix than what uh, some of the other people on the panel will have viewed as the appropriate thing to do. But it fits who we are, our size, where we play, which is mostly in North America. Uh, and, and I think, it, you know, those firms that, that continue to focus on those basics, you know, on the clients while we go through this are going to end up winning and we're going to earn an appropriate level of capital. It might not be as heady as it was in days gone by, but it'll be a, you know, continue to be a very good business. Mm. Ruth, what about you? How do you see your business? Where do you see the opportunities going forward? I think I used um, very similar words. I mean, throughout history, financial services, banks, investment banks, merchant banks have played a critical role really supporting growth in economies and have meaningfully, meaningfully evolved with the current capital liquidity requirements, which I don't think are going to subside, I think the main point is this notion that was prevalent pre-08, you wanted optionality, you wanted optionality on products, you wanted optionality on footprint, and it did result in, in larger sprawling enterprises, and optionality isn't free. And so I think you know, what we've done at Morgan Stanley, and I think you see um, others Similarly, is you have to go back to your core. Where are you differentiated? I think we're going to see sub substantially greater differentiation in strategies because it's imperative to really play to your strengths. So we've meaningfully evolved our wealth management business, grown that. That was one of the positives that came out of the crisis. It's now about half of what we do and are very focused on having a much more annuity-like set of businesses. About 85% of us today is more annuity-like and meaningfully reduced fixed income. Our view was all that optionality doesn't come for free. There's a lot of capital and liquidity that goes along with it, but we need a certain size consistent with Morgan Stanley. May not be the right strategy for a number of other firms, but standing still is not acceptable. And then adding to that technology, so one of the many positives of technology, for example, within fixed income markets is we are expecting to see more of the electronification within fixed income. Clearing is one of the first outgrowths yeah. of it is a positive, but seeing it in trading where markets are large um, and quite homogeneous, the macro markets, rates and FX, we'll see more of an equity-like approach to that over time. And we think that enhances both efficiency for the firms as well as the client experience. So again, pick your spots, play to your strengths, all the, strat the strategies shouldn't be the same. Don't stand still because the market clearly isn't and firms need to evolve. And I think as a result of the evolution that we've taken, we see growth opportunities regardless of the state of the economy. So our growth, one of our key growth elements is we now have a bank, the 10th largest depository in the U.S. embedded within Morgan Stanley. So we have a growth driver regardless of the uptick in, in the macro environment, which is a positive. So within the regulated world, I see evolution. I think technology, we've talked a lot about technology as being somewhat of a defensive tool. But I also think when you look at what's going on in, in this country, what's going on, on north in California here, the growth in disruptive technologies and their, their application to financial services is also very exciting. We're seeing it in new approaches to payments. We're seeing it in peer-to-peer -peer activities in lending. And so, again, as much as one wants to ensure we understand those risks, it's also a very exciting place, I think, for us to be with broad applicability. We're seeing the same type of of growth outside of the U.S. Uh, and uh, those two, I think it's obviously hard to sit here today and know what disruptive technologies will be doing five, ten years out, but a very important part of the way the industry evolves. Can that technology be a threat, though? I mean, do you see the, the risk of disintermediation of, of business models, or do you, do you see it more as something that is going to be more enhancing to the, the current strengths of the organization? Look, a technology can be both a threat and an opportunity, mm -hmm. and um, to assume that we're going to stand still, uh, it, you know, firms like ours need to evolve and recognize that when you have uh, when, when you have the emergence of new technologies, there's a place for the independent entities, the technology companies. There's an application for that, and then it begs the question of where are we strong? It's, I very much think it comes back to well, what is it that our clients want? How do we best service our clients with content and execution, and it's a set of skills within 
a firm mm -hmm. like Morgan Stanley that's really important. So hard to view technology. I can't, we, we can't put our head in the sure. sand and assume it's not going to be there. And so we need to really question ourselves and say disruptive technologies, by definition, let's be ahead of it. Let's embrace it. Let's understand how it either complements what we do or suggests there are other areas. But I think it will trans continue to transform what we're doing in financial services. Bob, from your perspective, I mean, how do you see it? Obviously, you know, you've, you've run very large financial institutions. You're now on the private equity side. How do you see sort of the future of the, you know, I, I would say the banking industry, but also more broadly the financial industry as you sort of see the emergence of the non-banks here? You know, it's providing probably more entrepreneurial opportunity today than any time in my career. And, you know, I rode a wonderful wave of financial services from the late 70s and early 80s to before the crisis, and it was about consolidation, it was about globalization, and, you know, to the Senator's point earlier, too big to fail isn't about not allowing institutions to fail. We're America. Failure is fine. Get back up, pick yourself up. The problem was that institutions were too big or too complex so that that failure created systemic risk. Uh -huh. and created taxpayer bailouts. As you get to an environment now where there are going to be limitations on size and complexity, one of the great positives is these entrepreneurial opportunities. In our case, we're building a merchant bank. There's no real business model because it's never been quite the same. Technology is a huge advantage, but one of the things that we love, merchant banking to us is about going deeper. Um, partnering with management, often taking majority positions, being operators and improving operational excellence. We've looked at about 40 deals in the year since we started Atlas Merchant Capital. And uh, as you will know, not one of those deals has there been competition from one of the larger banks. Where pre-crisis, everything we've been looking at would have been snapped up by the bigger banks. So there is a real positive, and in these entrepreneurial more entrepreneurial, smaller, more focused models, failure is okay, yeah. because failure is not creating systemic risk. Okay. So it's a completely different mindset. Mm -hmm. And the cloud and the other things we've been talking about in technology are huge enablers. So just to touch on one, Ruth, that I know you think about as well, the mobile phone. And you talk about um, you know, over 50% of financial transactions on mobile phones in the world every day over 50% come from Kenya, one country. But they're not banking, they're financial transactions, they're moving money. No one yet has taken you know, the backbone of a regulated bank and really developed you know, the, 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 the true suite of, of products that are necessary as a bank. So there's huge opportunity. In Kenya, there were some very special things. There was a monopoly phone company which allowed it, and it was a great development, and PESA's been a great success. But it's not mobile banking, and there are still huge opportunities in India, in Africa, where so many of the people are unbanked. So you can tell I'm pumped, but there are so many entrepreneurial opportunities out there uh, in financial services. I think it's the biggest positive that's come out of this. Do you see them both? I mean, but the examples you cited have been more in the emerging world, uh, obviously given well, your for, focus for, right now, but how do you see that? For mobile, mobile technology, I'll give you a, a very simple example. We announced the acquisition of a, a bank in Rwanda two weeks mm -hmm. ago, and it's a, it's a great bank. It's been there for 47 years, but it has no branches. What a perfect opportunity if you have one of the strongest banks with no branches. We, you, and if you were in Africa where 75 to 80 percent of the people have never been in a branch, would you open branches or would you invest in the technology of a mobile phone? So it's far more likely to happen, Rob, in Rwanda or in Kenya mm -hmm. or in, in uh, Botswana than it is going to be in the United States where all of us grew up with branches and most of us have access to branches. So it's Although, much more likely to happen there. Although one of the things we're most proud of is our bank. We have a bank and we have no bricks and mortar. And so yeah. very much to your point, having yeah. created this starting in 2009, you know they have a bank with no bricks the and bank mortar. is really a part of our wealth management yep. business. And we spent a billion and a quarter to integrate our business with our joint venture partner to have one technology platform. And as soon as we were done with that, very much to your point, we announced we were spending another 500 million 
to add great technology applications because we want our platform to be the best experience for our financial advisors and our clients. No bricks and mortar. So when we talk about the upside from this, we can service our clients. We don't need a legacy bricks and mortar. It's more profitable for us, and it's communicating to them the way they want. So again, I think that we're in a relatively unique division. New models. It's, it's yeah. a new model, new model, that it is much more yeah. akin to Fantastic. what you're seeing. And yeah. when you have a blank sheet of paper and you can say, in this day and age, do people really need to go into a branch? Speaking of non-bricks and mortars and new business models, Richard, where's technology taking us in the next five years? Well, I, I think we've got just gone to a great conclusion that the future of Wall Street is technology, so I'm <laughs> delighted that we're there. And, but let's focus on the future of Wall Street. So the future of Wall Street is the ability to service customers better, more effectively. The future of Wall Street is the, the opportunity to create a safer environment, all right, for everyone involved. Future of Wall Street is the ability with technology to prevent the next crisis. And, and one could argue that the future of Wall Street, by doing this, could create an ability where the regulatory front becomes a little less contentious. All right? I don't, I don't, dealing with regulators as often as I do, and I'm there on an execution basis, not on a is it right or wrong, I've never left any, whether it be FINRA, the SEC, or any organization, not believing that these are extraordinarily hardworking people, uh, pretty underpaid from my point of view, who care very, very deeply about the safety and the integrity of our markets. Yeah. And that, that makes us us. I think as we go forward, though, we can use technology more effectively, okay, not just from a after-the-fact point of view, but from an overall customer point of view. You know, Tom, I, I personally want to recognize your leadership in recognizing the importance of outsourcing. Um, I wanted to point to you that I do have a pen, and I'm sure I can put that together a contract very quickly, so. <laughs> yeah. um, but there, 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 is, there is going to be this, this, this view that, let's take the non-differentiating things and, and put people's real resources and talent on things that differentiate, and Ruth, I agree with you, the models are gonna change dramatically because there really isn't a choice. The old model will not take people where they wanna be. And whether it be a recognition of new markets, whether it be a recognition of a evolving strategy or continued solid execution, um, people need to invest more in their businesses and beyond the cost advantage, there's a benefit to having the non-differentiating activities in one place where everybody, including the regulators, can get better hands around it and understand the risk better. So we've talked a little bit about regulation. You know, we've talked, obviously, about you know, some of the, you know, Tom focused on, uh, talked about focusing on the businesses that you're good at and having the discipline to, uh, to really grow your winners and essentially cut your losers. Uh, you know, Bob and Ruth, you talked a bit about some of these new, you know, expanding existing business models or, or, or new business models, and certainly Richard, you know, talking about the, uh, the tech use of technology and where this thing's going. I mean, I guess, you know, we've got a couple of minutes left here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it back to Senator Dodd here, uh, you know, to, uh, to have the final, uh, the final word here, uh, both about how you see things in the future, and also in looking back, you know, the, I guess the last question I'd ask you is, and looking back now, is there anything you would have done differently? It's about this bill in my in life. This, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, we won't go there. Uh, thanks. Uh, the, uh, I, I was thinking as you're talking about the, the, the technology and disruptive industries and how do they become threats and also allies. In this new world I'm in as the head of the Motion Picture Association, mm -hmm. we're in Los Angeles. Uh, I've been asked what my, how my life has changed from uh, 36 years in, in public life to now, and I've said I. The comparison is I left one group of bad actors for another group of bad actors. <laughs> sort of a lateral move here along the, along the way. But, but technology is, exactly. It, it's, uh, people have asked me about the, the attendance at films, in fact. I was just telling, um, I think it was either you, Rob, or, or, or Rich, I don't know it was, that uh, people with technology, more than four or five devices of technology, are uh, more likely to go twice as often to see a film in a theater than people who are not tech savvy. It seems counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Uh, but people with technology, it isn't they love technology, they love content. And in a sense, what you're talking about is providing content for people, in this case, financial services to people in a way they'd like to get it when they want it, how they want it, where they want it, expeditiously. So it's, it's it, it, the, the purpose of technology, 
The only other point I want to make with you, uh, if I can, Bob, is that issue of, of innovation and creativity and protecting the intellectual property uh, in developing countries is critically important as well. Mm -hmm. Things you do differently. Look, I, it, it, if, if I were king for a day, what would I have done with this bill? And, uh, and obviously, it wasn't king for a day. I introduced a bill in, uh, about a year before this bill became law, the one we're talking about, in which I had a single prudential regulator. I mean, part of the problem was we were over, over regulated in some ways with too many regulatory bodies. Yep. So I had one prudential regulator. I incorporated consumer protection within the prudential regulator. So you'd have some sort of a meeting of the minds between prudential regulation and consumer protection. I think I had about three votes for that idea at the time. In retrospect, I think people would like me to revive the idea if I were back in Congress, but it would have made a difference. I mentioned the self-funding of the SEC and the CFTC. I would have consolidated both of them. I regret we didn't do it. It's the 21st century. It's ridiculous in my view that we have a duplication between the CFTC and the SEC uh, as a fa matter of, uh, of fact. I, I wish we had done more on housing finance. The Fannie and Freddie issues are, are complex. We never could figure out a way to come up with this a big debate about whether or not you'd even have the government involved in housing finance. But nonetheless, I regret we didn't do that. Bankruptcy laws need to be addressed in a more complex way. They basically deal with one-off situations. And as you point out, uh, uh, Bob, the, the, the importance of being able to take a, uh, uh, unwinding an institution. Yep. Uh, you've got to be very careful that you don't have the collateral damage of healthy institutions that, that, that suffer. Our bankruptcy laws are not really designed to accommodate that event. And hopefully we don't get to that, but if we do, I'm worried that we haven't adequately addressed that through the bankruptcy laws on how to address it. In the process, so those are three or four things that uh, that uh, I, uh, we didn't do, or that I would have done differently. There are a few other matters as well, uh, more specific matters, rating agencies mm -hmm. and the like. We could have done differently and better, in my view. But as I said at the outset of the remarks, there was, there's nothing uh, uh, perfect about this. Far from it. Having been around long enough, involved in an awful lot of legislation over the years, you're doing the best you can under those circumstances. You never could have passed this bill in 2005, six, or seven, or eight. It never could have passed it in 2011 or 12. There was the one window that opened up in the wake of the events of the fall of 2008 that created an opportunity to sort of redesign and relook at the architecture of financial services. People have been talking about it for years in many ways. I would like to see us address some of the Fed issues as well, not to destroy the independence of it, quite the opposite, um, but the supervisory function, how the regional banks are set up and so forth. Someone ought to look at that down the road uh, as well. And there are efforts underway to deal with things like housing finance and so forth that are now being considered in Congress. Uh, but my hope would be as, as we go, go forward and as the next crisis will emerge, that we'll anticipate it, we'll see it in advance, we'll utilize the technologies that exist so we identify things early enough and minimize the collateral damage that can occur uh, as well as, uh, as watch uh, things grow. And I agree with what, uh, again, Bob has said. I think this is an exciting time. Uh, I think the opportunities are incredible. I think younger people coming along in this industry are going to have incredible careers in developing new models and new ideas and hope nothing we've done with this bill restrains that ability, in fact encourages it. And the last thing you want to do is passing banking bills every time a new product or a new idea emerges. And what I think we tried to do here, what I tried to do certainly, was to try and set some abilities to respond to new ideas and if they pose systemic risk then to address them instead of having to pass a new bill in the process. So hopefully that was what we did with the bill and time will tell. Well, that's, 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 a, that's a very uh, encouraging last word. So I want to thank all the panelists uh, for their insights, and thank you all for joining us uh, for the panel today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.